um, that are caused by modification of gene expression rather than the alteration of the gene itself. So um, GWAS is a single nucleotide polymorphism. Instead of an A, you have a, a C. Um, and in epigenetics, what happens is, for example, this is very simplified, if I am under a lot of stress, that causes chemical changes in my body, which in turn leads to the addition of a methyl group to the cytosine along my DNA sequence, and that is known as a CPG, or cytosine phosphate guanine um, bond. And we are able to quantify the number of CPGs in our genome. The CPGs, the methylation actually of the um, genetic loci can either cause a gene to turn off or stay the same. And so sometimes hypermethylation leads to the turning off of a gene, which changes the outcome of disease. And so this can be caused by stress, it can be caused by exercise, diet, a number of environmental exposures. And so this is one small way in which we're able to measure something other than genetics um, for disease associations. And this is um, a summary of some of our work looking at uh, a number of the different genes that have been implicated in epigenetics, the associated condition, and then also the reference to where it was published. And this was um, one of the papers that I published with respect to type 2 diabetes, which shows that there are loci within this gene that um, are protected, actually, of type 2 diabetes, and they've been replicated in different populations. So PMI is sort of another systems approach that is underway. It's a precision medicine initiative, long-term research endeavor, also through NIH, um, that's currently ongoing. Uh, this was launched, if I'm not mistaken, by Barack Obama. Uh, all of us is a part of that. So you may see advertisement at your universities, maybe not, but in the end, what they really want to get at is not only this um, very rich database of, of um, a, a multitude of data, but also different types of data, but also they want to make this data available for open sharing. That doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, the average Joe logs in and downloads all the data. It's more so like all of the investigators in this room would have access to that data so that we could look at causal inference, you know, or we could look at um, the data from a sociology perspective and so forth and not just genetics is what happened. Can I just put in one plug too? If you want to know more about all of us or other other um, cohorts like that, there's a plenary session on Monday at okay. 10, 30, uh, 10.45, something like that. On, and all of us echo and more about precision medicine will be talked about. So if you're interested, it's a nice little carryover. That was a great plug. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, we really need, though, to include uh, very diverse populations in genomics research in order to accomplish a lot of these things. And all of us, I think, is trying to get at that. They're really very heavily recruiting a very diverse sample of individuals to be a part of that study. Um, but, you know, I think that we need to think of implementation science not as an afterthought. We need to think about implementation science sort of at the beginning, even if we're at the T1 level. Uh, so that we can start to think about how our research is going to fit into the implementation down the road, right, of these evidence-based um, interventions or what have you. And so in parallel, we need to think about it when we're thinking about the design and the conduct of genomic studies, and only then can we improve the rigor of genomic medicine and the way that implementation science is conducted. So um, these are my acknowledgments. Um, this is who I've worked with for um, that SLC paper that I've told you about. These are my collaborators at UAB. Um, I'm on a K01, and so these are some of my mentors on that K01. Um, this is my current funding. If anyone is applying for funding or has questions about any of these funding mechanisms, I'd be happy to answer them. I also just got a loan repayment program award, so if you're applying for that, I'd be happy to help with that. Um, and that's it. Any questions? Do you have any? <laughs> yes, Anna. So um, 
I was thinking back to like a few years ago, I was a part of a work group at Columbia that was thinking through inclusion and PMI, NIH funded. And we were so focused on how to get more uh, diversity of uh, African ancestry because of the, you know, kind of the, all the permutations, et cetera, the, the richness there and other, other groups as well. And I don't think I had thought about the fact that it's a win-win. So, I mean, I think this might be one of those situations in health equity where what's good for minority populations actually ends up being really good for everybody, majority population as well, if the Tracy um, uh, anecdote you know, has more kind of like, more to it than just Tracy and a few other examples. Sure. Not being like a genetics, genomics um, person, I wouldn't really know how um, idiosyncratic or common or um, hopeful a situ that Tracy situation is. Yes, I think um, Trace, Tracy, um, Tracy is probably the exception to the rule. However, I would say that um, with the advent of new omic technologies like whole genome sequencing and exome sequencing, we are more easily able to um, identify those rare variants that may be associated with disease. The challenge that we run into is that in order to establish um, causality, right, um, an additional battery of tests and, and um, analyses have to happen. And one of the metrics in genomics research is that you need to be able to replicate your findings in an external population to which you originally discovered the variant in. And so the current challenge for me, for example, is that um, one of the questions I'm trying to answer is if there is an association between um, neighborhood adversity, for example, um, and gestational diabetes, and whether, um, getting back to, the, sort of to this mediation analysis, whether epigenetics is a mediator. So DNA methylation is a mediator of that association. This cohort that I'm working with is like the only cohort, right? And it's comprised of about 30 to 40% Mexican women. Um, there are three different groups of Asian women and there's about 8% that are black and then maybe you know 3% that are white. And so if I were to find something in, um, in the Mexican women of, in this cohort, to find another cohort like it, I think would be a huge challenge. And so then I have this finding that may or may not be spurious, right? Because it may not be generalizable to other populations. It may only be inherent to this one population that was recruited from Kaiser from the North Bay area of California. And so, um, those are the types of challenges that we're running into at this time is that, you know, even if we are able to recruit individuals, um, the replication seems to be a problem because there aren't just enough studies. Yes? I'm going to just add two things on that because one, I think that's a good example of when some of these studies like all of us or some of these other studies where there is a biorepository makes, I won't say easy, Easier, yes. maybe to find a, a, a population in which you can validate your findings. Um, but I also think that it also, um, whenever you're talking, at least in my experience recruiting patients, and you know, usually I'm in paid, so I recruit children, and I really am recruiting their fam their parents and legal guardians. But if I ever talk about DNA or blood taken from a patient for for genomics, or I work in telomics, um, I've been accused of many things. <laughs> Like wanting to make pneumonia clones, um, which I have no, you know, no cloning experience. So that's not going to happen. But I do think there's that careful, like you really have to balance sort of wanting to do genetic studies and then trying to convince somebody to give you their blood and do the genetic studies in their blood. And like, what are you going to do with the findings? And is it going to be spurious or is it going to be a real finding? And the, the whole thing with the Tracy patient, I think people just have gotten burned so many times, mm -hmm. um, and not, not an individual, but like groups of people have gotten burned that it's. I don't know. Once you get past the recruiting phase, it's, it's not, 
easy, but it, it's just that sometimes just getting the right population, it's really hard to give in some, yes, if, you know, this is really something worth doing, so. Agreed, yes, I think it's all in the framing. Um, there is a lot of history that is attached to omics research, so um, in, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, we have a lot of history with the Tuskegee study, and even to this day, the bad blood um, study comes up, right? And so it is a challenge in trying to recruit individuals. Um, one of the studies that um, I recently conducted and that I um, haven't yet analyzed the data for, um, because I don't have the money to run the assays, <laughs> so someone would fund me, but um, I collected saliva samples alongside blood samples to see if for things like epigenetics, it's a good enough proxy um, so that if we do community studies, we don't have to draw the two purple tops of blood from individuals to be able to run the epigenetic studies, right? That perhaps with the two mLs of saliva that you collect, you have enough DNA that you could do the epigenetic studies and that for certain phenotypes, like maybe, you know, I don't know, stress or obesity, that it would be a sufficient proxy. So there, there are things like that ongoing, but, you know, it is slow going. And so I think, you know, in the context of precision medicine and precision public health, these are some of the barriers that exist. Um, yes? to the individuals and communities and patients that really need the information. And it was, it was very striking to me that I, so I'm from Los Angeles, California. Originally, I live in Birmingham, Alabama. I am first generation, and I you know only want to graduate from high school and college and all of that stuff. And so I went back home, I don't know, this is two years ago, I guess, and um, I'm doing all this diabetes research, and oh my gosh, my aunt has diabetes, and so I go visit her, and I'm like, auntie, hey, um, so I do all this work, and you know, I've been trained, and, um, and this is, you know, this is what, <laughs> this is what we know, and this is what you should be eating, and I can help you, and I, my friend's a registered dietitian, and you know, and she wants none of it. And my mom, my mom, well, you know, your, your auntie got mad one day, and that's how she got diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think this is part of the frustration, right? Um, and it was also really, so that happened, and then it was really striking to me that there was this, this whole phenomenon of, like, the alternative facts, right? That um, the Russian bots and all the information they were interjecting into Facebook and how incredible those infographics that make it onto those Facebook Facebook feeds that have no scientific basis are, right? And how convincing they are for individuals. And there's actually one from, um, there's one about blood, and it has all of the, this just came through this week, from IFN Love Science, that's like, um, <laughs> <laughs> and it basically goes through all of the ingredients of blood, but it's, but it's lit, all the ingredients, if you will, are listed in these hard to understand words, like 
high dihydroxy oxygen, right? H2O. And, um, and so it basically says, like, don't be afraid of words you don't understand, right? Because the infographic says this is toxic and, you know, if you consume this, you'll die. And in isolation and in huge quantities, et cetera, that may be true, but all of these are components of our blood and so they're, it's inside your body and you're living and so don't be afraid of this. So I think it goes both ways. I think that as, in, as investigators, we need to learn how to communicate our research in lay terms that is uh, stimulating and I don't, need, I don't want to say convincing because I don't want to be manipulative of individuals, right? But I think in, in ways that people understand. Um, and not just work on publishing our paper in JAMA and Nature and Science, but doing our due diligence and making sure that you know, we are going out into the community and saying, hey guys, this is what I found, right? And this is what we're studying, and this is what it means, or this is what it could mean, and this is what your um, surveys and your data and your biological samples are helping us do. So I think that we owe people that. I also think we owe NHLBI and NIH and so forth um, due diligence as well in noting that we're doing these things and that this needs to be done and in what ways we think that we can do it, right? And so I think you're right, I think that um, we do need to communicate um, in both ways, if you will. I think it also goes to, so I did my um, doctoral research with um, churches in Brooklyn, New York, and it's on diabetes, and um, one of the church members said, Yes. You know? Yes. So, um, I think it's important to have diverse researchers as well. Someone that's from your community. I mean, I know you can't make anybody a doctorate <laughs> that comes out of the community, but um, they were really interested in the work I was doing for them to help with my doctoral research. And I did actually give them a report back to all the pastors that worked with me to show all the information that. Um, I collected from them, and then what they can do going forward is having diabetes sessions in their churches. Um, so the majority of the participants did say they wanted to do diabetes research or diabetes on classes in their churches. So I think it's important also to let you know, and I think NIH is you know is need to have more diverse researchers um, within the community so that you're more of a trusted person, and that they you know I mean, I can understand what you're saying, you're honest, like I don't want to be part of that. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to keep eating whatever they want to eat, but I mean, still in the back of their mind, they know what the right thing is to do, so maybe they can share that with other members of the family. Yes. So, yeah. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I think you know diversity of, of race, ethnicity is important in any field, um, but I also think diversity of thought, right, is also very, very important because, um, you know, I and we have. A, a huge proportion of the population in Birmingham, Alabama is African American. And while I don't look or sound like them, um, you know, I could very easily walk into a Hispanic Latino community and say and do, but I think it would be a lot harder for me to establish trust, right? Um, but I think that um, we all know establishing trust is the first step in working with communities, any community. Um, but we do owe it to them that once we gain that trust, that you know we continue to monitor and um, cater to that relationship, and we do so maybe by going back and giving periodic updates. Maybe it doesn't have to be in person, but maybe we send a newsletter, right, or we send a, a, an email, or we create a Facebook and we provide updates, and maybe you're the administrator behind that Facebook page. And so I think we need to think um, across discipline and not as an epidemiologist, I stay in my office and I run my SAS code, but that we um, make an effort to now, you know, we were talking earlier about the types of data that are available on the web and the many ways that we can communicate with people. And so that we take advantage of that um, and we make an effort to make science more available in a way that people understand it um, to the masses. 
because you have to recall, right? So when people write media um, announcements and so forth, they're writing at the, what, seventh grade level? Or higher. Or, or, so, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what we say in our journal articles is not going to be understood or read by the individuals that really need that information. Right? And medicine being what it is, you need these people to understand what's happening so that when they're in the clinic, they can say, hey, I know about this new treatment, or I know about this new drug, or I know about whatever it is that investigators are working on at that time, and that they can help advocate for themselves as well. Yes? I just wanna, so first of all, just thank you for, thank you for everybody's talk. I know, like, I think all the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you guys for your talks because your talks were really amazing and I love this talk and this is my area so I'm like oh what else do you have to say <laughs> so excited. Um, but I will say the other thing too is um, we talk about going into other people's communities I think it's just as important that they come to our community our community um, I you know sometimes we'll work with communities and then I'll ask them like can you would you mind coming and just sitting with one of my classes and talking to my students and you know they're like, sure, they love it. They think it's, a, you know, I love going to their communities, and so they like coming to ours. And I think it's important to do it both ways, right? Or yes. sometimes, I'll, you know, I've had people ask me, like, hey, my daughter's in high school, and can she just, like, follow you for a week? And I'm like, it's boring. She's going to be staring at my computer with me, but sure. <laughs> um, but I think it goes both ways, right? Like, they need to be invited to, to what we do on a daily basis so that they see we're, just, we're not just sitting around making stuff up. Like, there is a reason we do what we do. And so... I just gonna say, do it both ways. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I think that is very important. And I'd like to. So I work at NASH. We do occupational health studies, and this is actually something that's part of our mandate. And we design studies, and usually have people who work.